Anxious, I struggle to breathe. But your love surrounds me. Your love has found me. Reel me so easily. I, behind walls, I construct deep inside. But your love breaks through me. Your love pursues. Welcome back to a familiar place. Yesterday we were here in the Cenacle and we were going through one of the most important mysteries of the Christian faith, the institution of the Eucharist. But we came back here again today, Adam and I, because this place, as I mentioned, is um, the location for so many mysteries. And we can't have the Eucharist without the mystery of the priesthood. And so I wanted to take this time to reflect with each one of you on what we have designated an apostolic mystery on this day 19 of our pilgrimage. And that is when Jesus ordains his apostles as priests. This is the place where the priesthood in the New Testament began. And so I thought it would be nice to be able to go into that mystery and talk about it, especially because if we think about how things have been during this pandemic. I know my own family has suffered not being able to attend mass for, for months and then not being able to go to confession for months. And it's in those times when we don't have a priest right, you know, at our fingertips that we begin to value the priesthood even more. And I remember when um, I was in missions in South America I was told by another missionary who'd done missions in Brazil, I was in Argentina, that they were working with um, an indigenous tribe literally in the jungle of the Amazons, of the Amazon rainforest. 
And so what happened was they found that this group of people had been evangelized decades and decades and decades before. And when the missionary priest came, he was there only for a while, and then he left. But what he intended to do was to come back, and they were hoping to have a very vibrant Catholic community there. But he never did come back. But the people were so touched by his ministry, his work, and the faith, that every week they would come together, and they would go through all of the prayers of the Eucharistic celebration. They would lay out the vestments of the priest, and they would have uh, a table as an altar. And as soon as he got to the part of the institution of the Eucharist, saying the Eucharistic prayers, the people would kneel down in silence. And what they would pray for every single time that they came together was for a new priest to come. Priests are what allow the Eucharist to be with us all the time. If we can contemplate, as we did yesterday, how important it is to be able to eat the body of Christ and drink his blood and the life that it gives to us, the redemption, the atonement that it achieves, we have that thanks to the other thing, one of the other important actions that Jesus did during the Last Supper. So if we look at the Gospel of Matthew, I'm going to go to Matthew 22, verse 15. It's a very simple um, sentence, but it's filled with meaning, and that's how we can enter into this mystery. We read it also yesterday, but this is what it says. Actually, it's verse 19. He took the bread, said the blessing, broke it, and gave it to them, saying, Take this as my body, which will be given up for you. And just these seven words, do this in memory of me. These six words, do this in memory of me. So Matthew brings us this sentence, and it's on the basis of this that Christians for two millennia have been able to affirm that Jesus gave us his apostles as priests. This was their ordination ceremony. And if you've ever had the grace to be able to go to an ordination ceremony these days, it has a lot of different dimensions to it. Um, from the prostration of the priest on the ground in, in complete and total abandonment to the, the, the uh, God's will, um, the litanies of the saints are sung or are prayed, um, they have their hands anointed, they receive the chalice and the paten. But the most important moment of an ordination is when their hands, when um, there's the laying on of hands from the bishop to the priest. And then fellow priests also have that same, do that same action. And that's when the Holy Spirit comes in and the priesthood is um, perpetuated from um, generation to generation. So where is all of that at the Last Supper? Well, there is a very clear reason why Catholics know that Jesus instituted the um, priesthood here, and it goes with those six words, do this in memory of me. So I think it would be nice to go into those words. But as we do that, I would like each one of us to bring to mind um, maybe a spiritual director, a confessor, a parish priest, a pastor, who has played a key role in your own spiritual life. As we discussed in Caesarea Philippi, it's a mystery that brings together the divine and the human. It's overwhelming to think that he's placed so much in their hands. They're not perfect. In fact, many can be very scandalous. But I know that each one of us have probably had those examples of priests who have, you know, just brought us in to this grace of Christ. So let's keep them in mind right now and in prayer as we go through these, these six words of the gospel. I struggle to breathe But your love surrounds me Your love has found me Reel me so easily I Behind walls I construct deep inside But your love breaks through me Your love pursues So 
So first of all, um, we know that priesthood has to do with sacrifice. You may recall in your own catechism or in different theology you may have studied that Jesus is priest, prophet, and king. We will talk about his kingship when we talk about the crowning of thorns. But when we talk about um, priesthood, what is it that priests do? Go back to um, you know, Aaron, go back to actually even before that, the, Lev the Levites, which was one of the tribes of Israel, of, of Jacob, one of his sons, and they became the priests for the people of Israel. What were they supposed to do? They came um, before God in the name of all of the people. Their main work was to offer sacrifice. We spoke about this yesterday. The Eucharist is the sacrifice of Jesus. It's the new covenant in his blood. So, when Jesus says these words after instituting the Eucharist, he says, do this in memory of me. These first two words of do this are really important because there's a Greek word. If you look at the Greek a translation of the New Testament, it's P-O-I-E-O, poeo. I don't speak Greek, <laughs> but what this word means is offer. And offer is related to the word sacrifice. So offer, do this, sacrifice, make this offering. And if you look in the New Testament and you read about Aaron, remember Aaron was with Moses and he became the priest that Moses um, ordained, actually uh, following God's um, indication. And this word is used often, quite, quite often, when referring to Aaron and what he did, Aaron and his sons. So they were offering. It was also used when... Um, uh, you can read, I think it's in Numbers, where Moses speaks to Aaron about being the person who goes into the tent of meeting and makes an offering. It's that poeyo, okay? Poeyo, do, do this, offer, offer this, is actually what Jesus is saying. So let's go to the next word, do this in memory or in remembrance. Yesterday we spoke a little bit about the liturgical meaning of memory that comes from also Jewish understanding of memorial, just like in the Pesach, you're living again the exodus from slavery uh, in that, that specific moment. That's why they gird their loins and have their staff in their hand and they eat leaven, unleavened bread and they're ready to flee because they're living the same graces as an exodus. Well, liturgically speaking, the word memory or memorial also does that. It brings what happened in the past right into the present moment. But there's another sense to the word remembrance which speaks very clearly of the priesthood. And I'm sure you've heard this word before in, in some of your catechesis, and it's called anamnesis. It's a Greek word that they still use in the Greek Orthodox churches today, in the Greek Catholic churches. Um, and what that has is immense sacrificial meaning. Remembrance is the word anamnesis in Greek. In the Old Testament, in the New Testament, you can look at Numbers 10, you can look at Hebrews 10. They're speaking about sacrifice. So offer this in remembrance. Do this in remembrance. Offer this sacrifice is what Jesus is saying with these words. But let's move even further than that. When we look at um, St. John, and you know, John, the evangelist, was right next to Jesus at the Last Supper. It says that, and let me just look up um, John 13 right now, because I think it's worthwhile reading. So here in John 13, chapter 4, he tells us what happened at the Last Supper in his own words, and after a lot of reflection when he wrote his gospel. It said, it says here, we can start actually John 13, verse 3, not 4, but it says, in verse 3, fully aware that the Father had put everything into his power and that he had come from God and was returning to God, now in, chapter, in verse 4, he rose from supper and took off his outer garments. He took a towel and tied it around his waist. Then he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and dry them with a towel around his waist. He came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Master, are you going to wash my feet? Jesus answered and said to him, what I am doing you do not understand now, but you will understand later. Peter said to him, you will never wash my feet. Jesus answered him, unless I wash you, you will have no inheritance with me. 
And then he continues and speaks about the washing of the disciples' feet. And so in Holy Week, we have this um, tradition on Holy Thursday that the priest will take off his garments and he'll have 12 people and he will wash their feet. It's a very humbling thing, a very humiliating thing. It's, um, you know, these images of Pope Francis washing the feet of prisoners or of sick people, you know, just makes the round of social media in the world. But it goes beyond just a humble sign. It actually speaks about the priesthood, the washing of the feet. And the reason we know this, if you go to Exodus 40, um, in the actual rite of consecration where Moses is consecrating Aaron and his sons to perform this liturgical service on behalf of the people, it says that before they go into the tent of meeting, they wash their hands and it specifies they washed their feet before they came before the altar. And because this is something that the Jewish people had very, very um, present in their minds, this wasn't a detail that escaped them. And so it specifically says that, like I said, in Exodus 40. But with Peter's refusal that we also read in this gospel passage, um, we have to understand a little bit more. Peter says, no way, you're not washing my feet. I am not your servant. We know well that only servants of the household would do this. You are not my servant, Lord Jesus. I will wash your feet. You will not wash mine. It was a beautiful gesture of Peter. But when Jesus makes this clarification, if I do not wash you, you have no part in me? What is going through the apostles' minds, these good Jewish men? Part also has a Greek word to it, and that word is, is meros. And that means portion in the Old Testament. There's a portion that the Levitical tribe has. Remember, the Levites didn't receive a part or a portion of the land. And when that happened, what they are told is that their portion is actually God himself because they are his priests. That is their portion. You can also think in a more concrete way, the portion that they would receive from the sacrifices. Those are things that the priests would always have. So miros, or portion, refers to the priests. And it's in Numbers 18 and Deuteronomy 10 that it's, very, it's specified that their portion is God himself. So what are, we, what are we hearing in that? What did the apostles hear when Jesus said those words in this place? I want you to have a special part in me. I, God, am your portion, just like I was the portion for the priests of the Levites. You will not receive lands and all this, but I will be your joy. You will participate in me, not just your joy, but you will participate in me in a special way, a unique way, like the priests participated in a unique way in, in the people of Israel. So they understood this. They understood this clearly, but I think it's, um, it's, it's very united to that, that um, gesture of service that Jesus also makes when he's washing the, the apostles' feet, that gesture of service. Um, I'm just going to tell you a little story about myself that has to do with the priesthood as service. Household servants, they're supposed to serve the household of God. That's what priests are. They're servants, aren't they? And you've heard the, the um, description of what the Pope is, a servant of the servants of God, right? So I remember when I was discerning a vocation, and, you know, you need advice and help when you're trying to answer God's call or to understand what he might be calling you to. And so when I discovered what a spiritual director was, I went out and found a spiritual director. And so a priest with very good intentions helped me a couple of times we spoke. And he said something that, that really confirmed me in things that were going on in my own heart. He says, you know, I really think you do have a vocation. And so I started looking and sort of praying and seeing what is it that God wanted me to do. But the next time we spoke, um, his theology maybe wasn't as clear as it probably could have been, but he said to me, you know, I think you're called to be a priest. And I sort of... Uh, raised my head and looked at him and I said, I'm sorry, Father. And he said, oh yes, I know some bishops that are going to be ordaining women. Now in the Catholic Church, we have a very strong belief that the priesthood, the ministerial priesthood, is for men. 
It's always been that way. It's in the tradition. There's very strong teaching for that. And I knew that, and I thought, you know, I'm not sure I'm called to be a priest. Not at all. But some of the sisters that I met um, had a very strong sense of vindication, I would say. There needs to be power in the church, and why aren't women in that seat of power? And that's why we need to be in the Petrine ministry. We need to be in the priesthood, all of this. And it never really sat right with me as a woman. Many times we can go and say, well, it's because, you know, if, if you think about the most amazing saint in the church, it's actually not St. Peter. It's Mary, the mother of God. There's this Marian dimension which just permeates everything. And, and, uh, and Mary and her, her beauty and her femininity and her service, that's fantastic. That actually is something where women can serve. But I think when we talk about power and priesthood, it actually puts things completely in the wrong um, perspective. It's the wrong context. It doesn't even have to do with what they are. They're leaders, they're shepherds. They are men who are visible leaders of the church, absolutely. Priests are cooperators with our bishops. But the priesthood in and of itself is service. They are here to serve to wash our feet. And I think the apostles took this very much into their own hearts. And from the very beginning, if you look at the early writings, well, just look at Acts of the Apostles. Just look at the writings of St. Paul. Um, look at the, the liturgical writings in the, Fathers of the, well, in the Fathers of the Church, but even before that in the Didache, which talks about the liturgical practices of the early Christians. From the very beginning, the apostles understood that they had a special portion in Jesus. Uh, I think it's St. Augustine who says that they are the face of the Father. In persona Christi, we say. It's hard for me to actually let priests let me go through the door first as a woman when I'm always like, no, no, Christ goes before me. <laughs> but then I always say, don't remember, don't forget that one prayer, that Irish prayer, Christ be before me, behind me, above me, below me. So, I mean, they win. But in persona Christi, what a gift. What a gift we've been given in our priests. And again, this is where it all happened at the Last Supper, at the table, when Jesus washed their feet, when he said, do this in remembrance of me. So today I do invite you to, to, again, pray for those priests in your life, pray for those people who have helped you in your path to follow him, and let's pray that very soon around the world, all of the churches that still remain closed and people who are still um, barred from receiving the sacraments like they would want, both the Eucharist, um, confession, um, and even being anointed in their own participation in the priesthood through baptism and confirmation. When we receive, you know, that chrism that priests also receive when they're ordained, um, that that may be lifted very soon, and that all of us will be able to receive these sacraments through the hands of the priests. And also, I would like to invite us to all pray for um, seminarians. We will always need priests. And the priesthood is very difficult, it's challenging, it can be lonely, but it's also exceedingly fulfilling. So let's pray that we always have men who share this special part in Christ's life and ministry. Here behind me, you can see the beautiful abbey of the Dormition. It's a Benedictine abbey, and they're the same priests that actually take care of Tabka, where we have the multiplication of the loaves in Galilee. We met one of the oblates from there. 
And so what makes this <coughs> important is the fact that this abbey was built in the Crusader period. When the Crusader Kingdom came in, they did build um, a whole church around the Cenacle in the 12th century. And so it was, an, it was a massive building uh, that included um, several mysteries in that. One of those mysteries is the Assumption of Mary that will reflect on that, on that mystery very soon. But it also had different side chapels, uh, even though the center focus was also the upper room of the Eucharist. They had a side chapel where you found the King of, Z of Zion, or the King, King David, uh, which uh, was sort of like a tomb thing, but it was just a, a, a memory. And then you had a side chapel with the Assumption of Mary. And then, of course, the central part was a cenacle. But um, that original building suffered a lot of damage, and it wasn't until the 14th century that the Franciscans were able to rebuild the upper room structure um, based on the Crusader structure that was part of this great big church of Holy Zion, which was originally built in the 4th century. Um, and again, suffered a lot of damage. The original church, as I mentioned, called Hagia Zion, which is right on Mount Zion, which is where we are right now, um, was built around the upper room. So, and again, that was destroyed in 614 with the Persian invasion. They destroyed a lot of um, the churches in the Holy Land. And again, they were rebuilt with the Crusader period. And then, as I said, what we'll see inside was um, recovered and restored and built further up by the Franciscans. Now, in um, 1948, when uh, the state of Israel came into existence, the Israeli government did take over part of this area and they made what was that side altar commemorating David, King David, into a synagogue. And that's called the Tomb of David, which actually, it's impossible that that's his tomb. We don't know where his tomb is. But they do um, have that place set aside as a very important place, a very important synagogue. We're coming up the steps to a place which I hope is open. It's an outlook over the city of Jerusalem. On the roof of the cynical. So this is the roof of the Cenacle. We also have a magnificent view of Jerusalem from here. We can see where Jesus began his passion. If we come right over here, you can very clearly see the Mount of Olives and the enormous cemetery of all of those awaiting the resurrection. You can see the tower that marks the place very close to where Jesus ascends to heaven. You can see the pathway down the Mount of Olives. You can see, if you look very closely, the Pater Noster, right below that large church tower that we visited where Jesus taught us how to pray. You can see the tree-lined path, the road down to the Domus Flevit where Jesus wept over Jerusalem. In the background, you can see those golden towers or golden onion-shaped domes of the Church of Mary Magdalene of the Orthodox. Right at the base is where Jesus suffered in Gethsemane, and here you can see the golden dome of the Dome of the Rock on the Temple Mount. Over there would be Bethany. And in the distance would be Bethlehem. On this side of the roof of the Cenacle, we see in brilliant sunshine the Abbey of the Dormition. And also the beautiful small church right over here of the Cenacle, the Cenaculino, the small Cenacle. And then looking out onto the Temple Mount.
So today as we pray our prayer, our decade of the rosary for priests, we're blessed to be joined by two priests who are here in the Holy Land. One is our um, Chargé of Notre Dame of Jerusalem Center, Father David Steffi, and also we have Father Salvador Fernandez who has been in the Holy Land now since 2005, if I'm not mistaken. And so we're actually sitting on the steps of a chapel that goes up to, excuse me, the steps here in the Cynical that used to go up to a Christian chapel commemorating the moment when the risen Christ appeared to St. Thomas. And remember, Thomas wasn't with the apostles when he appeared on the day of the resurrection, but he did come after. And so he was able to touch Jesus' wounds, and that's when his faith was fortified. And right in front of us, as you saw in the image we just took, there's another stairway. And that was leading up to a chapel that commemorated the descent of the Holy Spirit, one of the other events that happened here in the Cynical, besides the other two that we've been speaking about. So again, um, we can recollect ourselves as we begin this apostolic mystery, giving thanks to God for giving us through the apostles the ministry of the priesthood. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. As it was in the beginning, it is now, and ever shall be, world without end. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. So, unfortunately, we weren't able to go to the Pater Noster. We'll have a chance to go there a little bit later in our pilgrimage, God willing. But we have two Paters with us, as I said at the beginning, and so that's even more important, I think, than, than the place where Jesus taught us the Our Father, but we have our priests with us. And it's also neat that right behind us, Father Fernandez, who has so much experience here in the Holy Land, um, we're looking at the oldest wall of the Cenacle. Remember, this isn't the original building by any stretch of the imagination, but it is the Crusader building that was put here and then restored and rebuilt and messed up and then fixed up again. So it's neat to be able to be part of this history, but we also remember that it was here, right here, right here, that uh, Mary, just like we prayed in the rosary, also taught um, the Christian community about the importance of the priesthood and the importance of um, of service that the apostles will give as priests. So just a quick question from our two priests here. Uh, Father Fernandez, how long have you been a priest? 1984. Oh, 1984. 63 years old. 
Okay. Please. Wonderful. Oh my gosh. So yes, that's a long time. Um, that that's a long time being a priest. And how about you, Father David? Twenty-five years. Father David's been a priest. You're celebrating your jubilee. I celebrated in November twenty-fifth, uh, two thousand and twenty. And are you happy being a priest, Father David? Of course. <laughs> and how about you, Father Salvador? Are you happy as a priest? Of course, especially here. I, I kiss the, the, the floor ah. because here it was instituted the priesthood. Yes. He, I said it was 220. It was actually 219. A 219, okay. So if, if you heard Father Fernandez, he actually kissed the floor because this is where the priesthood was instituted. And for those of you following the pilgrimage with Father Juan, he actually explains a little bit about the rite of ordination, and he himself also prostrated himself on this floor. So let's give thanks to God for this great gift, and thank you both for joining us today. Thank you. God bless you, and we will see you for day 20 tomorrow.